So um, Laura is going to be include is going to be uh, showing us some cases uh, later on in this talk. She said, "Yeah." And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, visual field testing. And some of you may have heard this talk before because, you know, we are on a two-year cycle now um, and previously on a three-year cycle. So some of you may have heard the talk before. Some of you, it's all new. And uh, so let's, without any further ado. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is how to do visual field testing, how to record visual field testing, um, various testing strategies, and testing artifacts in automated perimetry. And uh, so you all remember the visual system, okay? I'm going to just take that as given. But um, there are a variety of ways in which you can test the visual system. Um, a lot of people sort of conceive of the visual field as sort of this uh, mountain of vision in a sea of darkness, right? And the point of this mountain is that the vision is not as good in the periphery, and then it gets better and better and better towards the center. And so this rising peak here indicates better and better and better acuity. And um, so what you can do is you can sort of enter into the field of vision with various sizes and brightnesses of objects and expect them to be seen um, progressively closer towards the center as they get smaller and dimmer. Okay. Um, uh, the most common uh, uh, way of uh, field division testing is confrontation fields. I prefer confrontation rather than confrontational because I think confrontational implies, <laughs> can you say this? <laughs> okay, so um, here you are, you're lining yourself up with a patient's eye. When you're doing count fingers vision, you don't really need to have it carefully aligned with a patient's eye. You can just have them look at your nose and you can keep your eyes open. Um, and then it gives you both hands free. Um, so uh, uh, some people do uh, one or two, some people do one or two or five fingers of counting. Um, it's important to make sure, and this is something we start off with the medical students, which is coming up up on Monday in a couple of weeks, um, to make sure that the fingers are not aligned like this. How many fingers? I don't know. Is that one or two? I can't tell. So you're testing in all four quadrants, not out here. And we make the point with um, the medical school testing somebody in there is teaching the medical students to, to do the semaphore version of visual field testing, but nobody admits it. So. Um, the other way of doing the visual field testing is with some sort of more uh, formal testing method, and they all employ some kind of a bowl representing uh, visual space around the patient. Um, <clears throat> When you're talking about uh, kinetic perimetry, uh, the, it's a moving target coming in towards the center, and you uh, have a certain specified brightness and size of stimulus that is brought in from the edges, and then you join up those uh, uh, dots um, representing uh, what they call an isopter of a visual, uh, visual field. Um, and in static perimetry, you're uh, shining different brightnesses and sizes of objects uh, uh, in various locations, and the brightness uh, is um, going to be uh, variably detected as you get closer towards the center. Uh, so kinetic meaning moving, and static meaning not moving. And so in uh, kinetic perimetry, you get these isopters, and in static perimetry, you just get this sort of uh, uh, graded uh, mountain of vision. We also have the beloved tangent screen. We use that a lot. It is not just a way of decorating the walls. Um, there's one at the VA. There's actually a regular one at the VA somewhere, but um, that got moved. But the one down in um, low vision service is just perfectly fine. As a matter of fact, it's the fanciest one I've ever seen. It's very, very nice. And the nice thing about the tangent screen is, unlike all the other methods, with the tangent screen, you can vary the distance of the patient from the screen rather than just the brightness and size of objects. So in recording the field of vision, um, the right eye goes on the right, the left eye goes on the left. This is the only thing that is different in entire medicine where things are reversed, right? Everything else is as if the patient is lying on the page and you're looking at them. Um, in the visual field, it's as if the patient has the field and is just kind of burning it, it's like Superman, burning it into the page. Um, one of the most 
uh, successful ways of determining which visual field you're looking at is uh, by looking at the uh, appearance of the physiologic blind spot. And you want to double check in a Humphrey um, automated perimetry uh, that the um, where the machine thinks the blind spot is actually where the blind spot is turning up. There's a little gap in the printout where the blind spot is intended to be on a Humphrey visual field. And if it's not turning up where the blind spot is, then you may be looking at a patient being tested on the wrong eye. So um, moving on to some of the uh, automated perimetries, there are a wide variety. Almost everybody now is going with some form of CETA. Does anybody know what CETA stands for? Something, something. Algorithm. Threshold algorithm, Swedish. I think it's integrate, interactive, actually. Inter not inter integrative, interactive. And so what's interesting about CETA testing is that basically the machine assumes that a certain visual field exists. And then as the test is being done, that field is being modified and updated during the testing. And so um, before that, basically, the stimuli were presented at a certain speed and a certain brightness, regardless of what the patient was doing. And with this interactive, um, the, the machine does a few sort of preliminary tests and decides how the patient is seeing and how quickly they're responding and adjusts accordingly. And uh, so what that results in is a huge variation in the amount of time that it takes to do a test. So um, I, you guys all need to be aware. So full threshold testing is really nice, but it can take up to 20 minutes per eye, which is agony, right? That is not a fun thing. So the regular CETA standard can, if, if a patient is doing well, can take you know five, six minutes per eye, which is way more tolerable. And the CETA fast, which has a commensurate slight decrement in information, is uh, usually five minutes and under. So um, you, can, you can really uh, speed up the situation by, changing your algorithm. So um, uh, of course, an ophthalmologist never trust anything, uh, but somebody's done some testing and comparing CETA to golden visual fields, because we were all raised on golden visual fields. Goldmans are preferred by the patients, I think mostly because you can chit chat with the examiner while you're doing it. Uh, you cannot do that during a CETA test. You have to really maintain your attention. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, having a little chit chat um, can help to keep you awake. So you know, it's not an unreasonable thing when a patient is a child or an elder person or somebody's had a stroke or uh, falling asleep to switch to a Goldman because of that chattiness. Um, CETA is way faster. Um, it's uh, um, much more sensitive. Um, uh, it's, uh, CETA is at least as good as a full threshold. So the testing has been done. It's pretty good for picking up defects. Um, and it, they concluded that it was a useful alternative. Um, I just wanted to mention some of the uh, variants, and I've heard that the, this, this kinetic fixation is actually going to happen. Um, basically, um, all of the other tests, there is a central fixation target and the spots appear uh, around it. In this um, kinetic fixation perimetry, the, the, the fixation target is moving around. And then the, uh, the testing um, uh, spots appear around it in the same proportion. Um, and uh, you, I think it's much more comfortable. I think that you know, we all get complaints about, well, I was looking at that dot and it totally disappeared. Or I saw five dots in the center. Or you know, I thought I saw the dot, but then it seemed to totally go away. Or yeah, all kinds of hallucinatory experiences. And I mean, the human eye is not intended to stare into a bright white bowl you know, for more than a few seconds. So I think that this sort of thing might actually come up. Uh, this is a, a printout of one of those um, early tests. Um, the other thing you guys need to know about is that there are a bunch of screening tests out there. Uh, these are um, a uh, money-making proposition. Um, uh, some patients, when they go to their eye doctor, they sort of offered a menu. What would you like to do today? Do you want some photographs? Do you want a visual field? And some people will say, yeah, sure. And I've actually seen patients with a visual field defect picked up because they said, yeah, sure. And they had no idea anything was wrong, and off they went. But these screening tests are extremely efficient. 
Um, this is one of them where you have a sort of sinusoidal grating that's sort of moving. And so the patient will tell you that they were looking into a, into a little uh, uh, viewer and a little kind of flickering uh, thing appeared all around in their uh, peripheral vision. Uh, it's only 16 test points for this particular one. Um, and uh, so it was, it was specifically designed to try and capture um, M cell uh, neuronal death. Um, I don't know that it really does, uh, but it's nice because you don't have to be in a dark room. It's just looking into this little doohickey. Um, and they can ta it can tolerate a ton of blur, so refractive error is not so much of an issue. Um, and this would be the printout that you get. Um, this is a, like a perfect test result, and it's this little sort of um, strip that gets spit out of the machine, almost like uh, when you've done a uh, lensometer, right? The automated lensometry, and so you can sort of see that there's the little the little black dot over here in the left eye is over here on the left, and then it goes all the way out to 30 degrees nasally. So it, it is intended to screen for uh, um, gold, uh, glaucomatous problems. Um, it takes a couple of minutes per eye. The screening one is 45 seconds per eye. It's fast, it's compact, it's portable, it's inexpensive. Um, it can miss uh, neurologic deficits because the stimuli don't respect the vertical. Um, the targets are large, so small scotomata can be missed. But Dr. Wall, a neuroophthalmologist in Iowa, did some data on this, and he concluded that it was actually quite sensitive for optic neuropathies, its original intent, right, glaucoma, but it doesn't um, do very well with hemianopathy. I have seen, you know, hemianopia is picked up, but, but it's not very sensitive. So the advantages of automated perimetry, now we're, working, we're moving into the artifacts, okay? The advantages of the automated perimetry are uh, lack of observer bias. So um, a golden visual field, for instance, in an experienced hand uh, can be made to show almost any defect that you think it should. <laughs> Uh, so it's very easy as a, a Goldman um, to uh, find a defect that you, you intend. The Humphrey, uh, the Humphrey perimetry doesn't really have any of these uh, pretest biases. Uh, it's very reproducible, um, and almost everybody in the country has Humphrey. The major um, alternative is octopus. Uh, which is a very nice test, but unfortunately, since the color printout doesn't fax very well, um, as a matter of fact, it doesn't fax at all. Um, but um, it is um, the other nice thing about the auto automated perimetry is that um, there are a bunch of different test strategies, and you've seen us in um, in uh, clinic doing uh, testing with large, bright stimuli, the five size stimulus. Um, Etc. There's there are a lot of ways that you can go about doing the test, even with automated perimetry. And I would say that in in most cases now, a, a screening or CETAFAST will be faster than most Goldmans, except for a Goldman that's intended for driving. So driving evaluation Goldman, uh, which is a single size stimulus, the three size stimulus, the three five E, um, can take literally seconds, 30 seconds, you can get that done. Um, the other thing that's nice about automated perimetry is very quantitative. Um, and so if you're trying to follow a defect, then it's quite helpful. The disadvantage is, is uh, that it's run by a machine. So there's no chit-chatting. Um, there is adaptation for the patient, but not very much. And uh, it is prone to artifacts. And we're going to kind of go over some of those. So the players in inducing artifact and automated perimetry are the patient, the machine, and the technician. Um, so the patient, um, pupil size matters. With very small pupils, you're going to get constriction. Um, you do have to have accurate refraction. You do need the near end because the bowl is at about 14 inches. It's pretty close to the patient's eye. Poor vision is a poor vision field. Um, 2200 vision, you have to adjust. People have high myopia are better off using their contact lenses or even their glasses because the um, machine has a um, lens you can put in front of the patient's eye, but those can lead to artifact as well. Uh, ptosis uh, on the part of the patient, uh, concentration, reaction time, neurologic deficits can all play a role in your reliability of visual fields. So if they're going to wear their contacts, do you just do like an over refraction on that? Yep. And the near ad, whatever the near ad might be. Uh, so patient teaching. The technician, whoever's doing the visual field, like Reese here, 
can man the visual field the other day. You have to know what the patient's up for, right? If you don't understand the test, then you can't tell the patient how to do the test. Um, and they need to tell the patient how to do the fixation, how to respond even to dim stimuli. Uh, they have to be redirected during the test, but not too much, because if you're constantly hovering over the patient and moving their chin around and you know poking them in the back of the head and things to try and you know get their head uh, aligned, then the patients can get very frustrated and annoyed. And um, you know sometimes they'll say that that was that was the best visual field I've ever done, and sometimes they'll say that was so annoying. So um, the machine can be stopped in mid-flight, right? If you just hold down the, um, uh, the button, um, then the machine stops. And so if the patient is told that, if they need a rest, if they need artificial tears, something like that, they can stop the machine as it's going and then just resume the yes. Oh, no, you're just, <laughs> I thought you were asking a question. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> Some patients simply cannot do Humphrey vision field testing. They just, they, you know, every time they do the test, it gets worse, and they start getting anxiety attacks and things. It's, it's moderately stressful. Um, the machine issues. You have to choose the right protocol. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to choose the right stimulus size, and the correct parameters have to be put in. Um, there's a lot of information that has to get entered into the machine before the patient can even get started. And they have to put in the patient's age, the right correction, the pupil size, and they have to test the correct eye. So um, here's a, a classic artifact in visual field testing. What's going on here? It could be a rib artifact or it could be ptosis. So both have to be looked at. Um, in this case, uh, the pupil is two millimeters. Okay, and that's just not gonna work. And so after the patient's dilated, you can see a lot better response. Uh, what happened here? Lost fixation. Yeah. Could be from the lens. Could be from the lens. Anybody have any suggestions? Any other suggestions? Trigger happy. Trigger happy. This is too darn bright. Um, they have very, very, very good vision, or they're just pressing the button willy nilly. And fortunately, the machine can tell. Um, but look at that, fixation losses. They're looking around. Um, it's, it's just not a very reliable. Uh, false negatives, not none. So they're just, they're just really going to town. Mm -hmm. And um, so what about that one here? Phobial threshold there. What's that? One decibel, right? That can't be good. That's just that's just too dark. You can't do that test. So this is not a problem with the machine. It's a problem with the choice of the test. So with the three size there, they they can't do much. With the five size, you can actually maybe be able to follow that. So the one on the on the left is a three size. One on the right is a five size stimulus. Okay. What's the deal here? Could be, could yeah, could easily be, yeah. What's this one called? Cloverleaf. Everybody see why? It's a lucky day. <laughs> okay, so the cloverleaf visual fail, I want to explain that a little bit. So the machines are are kind of interestingly designed. Um, the first thing the machine does is test these four little spots um, uh, at about 10 degrees, which is, I put this in an amsa grid. If you, if you put an amsa grid in the back of the bowl, um, the four spots that are tested first are the ones out of about 10 degrees, okay, which on uh, AMSA is about there. So those are the four testing spots. These other guys in the middle are as close to center fixation as the machine gets, which is interesting. But um, so you can see here that, so the physiologic blind spot starts at about 10 degrees. So here's where the physiologic line spot would start, and so these, these testing spots are about 10 degrees. So you can actually have like a reverse clover leaf. This is where the patient didn't get the test. They didn't sort of understand what's going on during the initial sort of primer phase, and they just missed all four of the initial testing spots. So that tells you exactly, it's like a reverse clover leaf. So it tells you exactly where those first 
rounds of testing are occurring. Right at about 10 inches. Okay, what happened here? Could be ketosis again. Could be ketosis again. Yeah. And so you can take the lid and get the ptosis out of the way. What happened here? Rear mark effect. Yeah. See how, how mechanical that looks? Just doesn't look like anything sort of physiologic, especially the one on the right. That's pretty impressive. So rim artifact, um, uh, most often what's happening is that the lens is actually put, it's on this little stander, um, and it's put right up against the patient, and then over the course of the testing, the patient, like that. <laughs> and so the, they're looking sort of through this little uh, ring. Uh, so you have, it's best if you use kit lenses, but if, if you can't come up with the astigmatism correction that you need, then using the patient's own glasses as long as they're correctly positioned. Keep the patient awake and keep the head up against the fourth. It's just like when you're trying to do a slip length exam and the patient's falling back and you're like, I can't reach you. Can't. <laughs> they're only an inch away, but you know, it feels like they're. Okay, what happened here? The vertical position was off. The vertical position was off. Does anybody know how that would happen? Usually they like. Could be. I can tell you that it almost never happens in the other direction. Does that help? I've never seen it with the physiologic line slot displaced superiorly. Never, ever once. Anyone? 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 Okay. So this is looking into a Humphrey visual field um, bowl. Okay. This little thingy over here is the little camera that's watching fixation. And so down at the bottom of the printout, there'll be that little line that shows how well the patient is maintaining eye position. So this thingy down here, this is the um, uh, test that they use, that the machine uses to detect foveal threshold. It's this little set of diamonds, and um, it's a progressively brightening, kind of a, uh, like an orange colored stimulus, and it's down below. So as you're doing the foveal threshold, and that takes like maybe 30 seconds per eye, um, very, very helpful test. As you're doing the foveal threshold, um, that little portion of the test, blah, 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 goes on, gets done. And then what's supposed to happen is the patient's supposed to move their fixation up to the central fixation target, okay? And that is literally right straight ahead of you in the bowl. And if you don't do that, then the whole test is typically done with the patient looking at the little diamonds here down below. And that's, again, it's about 10 degrees off fixation. The blind spot is displaced inferiorly. And you'll often get these spurious upper visual field defects because, of course, you're testing way more peripheral peripheral vision than the machine is intending. Make sense? It's, it's a mechanical problem with fixation. And it happens all the time. And patients will say, well, I thought it was kind of weird, but you know, I just did what I was told. or, or <laughs> The tech will say, well, I, I, I know I told them to look straight ahead, but they it just, they just seemed like they weren't fixating properly. The machine is going nuts because it can't find the physiologic blind spot, etc. So what happened here? Is this patient radically getting worse over time? There she is. She's got a pretty nice visual film right there. And her little meningioma, has it like expanded and just gotten dramatically worse? You can see there's generalized depression there. And Is it worse? Could be. Let's do another MRI. Or we could check the, um, the parameters here. Somebody put in her date of birth incorrectly, right? And the machine thinks she's only 40 years old instead of 50 years old. And so she's being judged much more harshly, right? A 40-year-old and a 50-year-old will not have the same field of vision. And these machines are calibrated for age. So you're compared not against you know, 25-year-old lab rats are compared against your peers. Are they in, like, 10-year intervals usually, or how is that? Because I, I, like, I don't think that one or two years is probably going to make much of a difference, but a decade would. And I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's out there. But. I didn't know if it like, jumped off. And I don't, know, I don't know if it's bend or if it's a continuous yeah. variable. I'm not sure about that. But definitely a decade is going to make a difference. Yeah. 
So in automated perimetry, there are patient-related artifacts. You have to care, prepare the patient, you have to coach them, you have to monitor them, position them, dilate them, refract them, take care of their ptosis, and choose the right test. Right? You're not going to be able to get a good result if you ask for the wrong test. And there are machine-related artifacts. You have to choose the right test strategy. You have to check the parameters, the demographics, the lens position, the stimulus size. And I say, be one with the machine. Right? You have to really understand how the test works. Because when patients come out to you and say, you know, <laughs> that you saw Mickey Mouse in there, well, maybe they're not totally nuts. <laughs> so um, uh, I think I encourage everybody to actually have a visual field done on them because it's a very interesting and somewhat unpleasant experience. Okay, so let's go over some cases. All right, so the first case was a 65-year-old guy who was referred by his neurologist to evaluate his vision. One year prior to when he came to us, he had had a hemorrhagic stroke. And since then, he noticed that he'd frequently been bumping into objects on his left side. And he was describing micropsia and macropsia. So for him, when he would walk down a hallway, it would seem like the walls were getting bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. So his acuity was 20-20 in both eyes. He had no APD. His motility and alignment were normal, and his slit lamp of the anterior segment and his fundus exam were normal. OK, so here is his Humphrey visual field. So how would you describe this field defect? Anybody? This is an easy one. What? What? Quadrant. Very good. OK. So where was his hemorrhagic stroke? Right parietal. Right parietal. Okay, so here is his scan. There it is in the right parietal. So I found this di I didn't create this diagram, so I don't know <laughs> if this is against the rule, but I thought it was actually really nice whoever did make it, uh, describing kind of where the field projects onto the retina and then anatomically where that goes back, right? So he had a left lower quadrant tenopia, right? So it projects up here onto like the supranasal portion of the retina and the supratemporal here, right? So he, he's going to come down through the optic nerve, cross through the chiasm, go back in the right optic tract, synapse in the lateral geniculate nucleus, come up into the parietal lobe through the optic radiations, right? And the same on this side. Okay, so what other symptoms do you think this patient might have? This is some board review stuff. Let's say, what if it's his non-dominant hemisphere as most right-sided parietal lesions are? Okay, I'll put it up here. I know, it's hard, I had to look it up. So they get spatial disorientation, they can get dressing or construction apraxia. So dressing apraxia is when they have a hard time putting their clothes on. Because as you can imagine, I mean, it's really easy for us, you don't have to think about it, but when you really think about what your brain is doing, you're deciding like which side is up and where do the legs go in and where do the arms go in. So you have to really be able to appreciate the spatial relationship of like the, the pieces and the parts of the clothing. Uh, construction apraxia is when people have a really hard time either like repeating a drawing or creating even like a simple structure like popsicle stick type stuff. Uh, if it's the dominant hemisphere that's affected, they can have dysphagia or aphasia, apraxia, and then Gerstmann syndrome is a good thing to know for boards because they'll ask you about that. Um, they have a hard time doing basic calculations, writing, finger agnosia, sorry that's misspelled, is out uh, and they can't like recognize and name the different fingers that they have and they have a hard time telling right versus left. And hemi-neglect, hemispatial neglect usually happens from a right-sided lesion causing left-sided neglect. And that's because the right-sided space usually has redundant processing from both the right and left hemispheres. Um, but for most left brain dominant people, um, the left-sided space is just processed by the right hemisphere. 
Okay, next case is a 21-year-old woman who came into triage, this was just before Thanksgiving, uh, because she'd been noticing a gradual loss of vision in her right eye. She thinks maybe somewhere like the past one to three months has been pretty slow. She's not had any changes in the left eye, and she's been noticing some headaches several times per week for the past month, um, and they last sometimes the whole day, and she gets fairly light sensitive with them. And she was seen here back in 2012, and Dr. Vitali diagnosed her with mutes in the right eye. Um, there was a question of maybe whether or not it could be multifocal choroiditis, but she felt like, you know, well, it doesn't really matter if it's going to go away on its own, so she just never came back. So her acuity was 20 20 in both eyes. The technician that saw her and then dilated her thought that she maybe had an APD in the right eye and her motility and alignment were normal. Her anterior segment was unremarkable and on dilated exam, the report that you get is that the left optic nerve is maybe a little hyperemic. So what would be the next step now? So somebody's called you and they're like, oh, I have this person sitting here, I'm not sure what to do. I've already dilated them. Reveal. Very good. So, yeah. So, I put up here her confrontational field, and even though she was dilated, we decided to just go ahead and get one and see what pops up. So how would you describe this? Kind of incongruous uh, right hand view. Homonymous, right? Yeah. Yes, that's very good. So where would you expect to see a lesion? Uh, what part of the visual apparatus? Could be a lot of places, right? Like basically, sort of anywhere behind the chiasm. It's, yeah, it's somewhat congruous, maybe not. But what would you want to do to evaluate this? Sorry, did you say that her complaint was her left eye? Or? Yeah, her complaint was her right eye. Was her right eye. She didn't feel that there was anything going on in the left. Okay, so what would be the next step? Imaging. Imaging. What would you order? MRI. Okay. This is what came up on the MRI. So this actually turned out to be a hemangiopericytoma. So she just had that resected and she's still, she's in rehab now actually for that. So interestingly enough, um, so because she'd been having the symptoms for like one to three months and it was a really gradual onset, I didn't, I thought stroke was less likely and so I thought it's fine to do the scan as an outpatient. Um, the radiologist actually like came out and talked to her as they were doing the scan and sent her to the ER because she's got this big left shift there, so yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I pulled this back up just to kind of um, reiterate the anatomy there. So this, her field defect was like this, right? So it's gonna be these on the retina, right? So then these are gonna come back here and this comes all the way back here. So this is kind of, you have to think about this diagram being reversed in terms of the imaging, right? So this is the left side. Okay, the third case was a 43-year-old woman who was sent for a visual field defect found on automated perimetry. So she had gone in to see an optometrist three months prior to when we saw her for an annual exam. I mean, I say annual, but she hadn't been to anyone for a long time, but she just thought maybe she should get her eyes checked out. And the optometrist found bilateral optic nerve pallor and did fields and found these field defects. Uh, she herself has not noticed any changes really. So her past ocular history is significant for a lazy eye. So her left eye has been lazy ever since she was a little kid. And she told us that actually at age two she fell out of a second story window and she was in a coma for 90 days. And then she thinks ever since then the left eye has just kind of drifted out. And she hasn't had you know, she's not had close follow-up by any means. So she thinks that she may have seen somebody maybe like 10 years ago, maybe it was like 20 years ago, so she doesn't really know. Uh, and a few weeks ago she started getting headaches 
a few times per week. So because of the field defects and the way that her nerves looked, the optometrist had her get an MRI um, and we had the read on it, not the images, but it was normal. So her best corrected acuity is 20-20 in the right eye, 20-70 in the left eye. She had a small relative efferent pupillary defect in the left eye. She had a very large left XT. That was very competent. Her anterior segment was unremarkable. And her nerve, so she had a little bit of rim that was pink, left superiorly and inferiorly, and then temporally and nasally there was no rim. So I'm sorry, I don't have a photo of that, so I'm just pulling this up to show you. It was very thin. Okay, so here was her confrontational field. So what would you like to see next? Her Humphrey. So there it was. So how would you describe this? Yeah, bitemporal field defect. Okay, so where would you expect to see a lesion? Right, somewhere near the chiasm. Okay, so the MRI, which was done specifically to evaluate a bitemporal field defect, was normal. They saw no pituitary tumor. So now what? Very good. What other things, let's assume that it's not like a terrible radiologist that just missed a huge pituitary tumor, because that would be pretty unlikely, right? What's that? Like other medications in the past. That's good. She's not on any medications. What, else, what other things could give you a bitemporal field defect besides a pituitary tumor? That's, I know it's the one you think of right away, but what? You would probably see it by an aneurysm. An aneurysm, very good. Anything else? What? No, tu I'm saying besides a tumor. Forget a tumor in that area. But that's good, yeah, if it was coming up from below. Other kinds of tumors. Other kinds of tumors, yeah. No tumor. Very good, you can get a chiasmitis from that. Yep, very good, you can get it from sarcoid. And what else? What other, what other disease that's autoimmune can cause inflammation of the nerves that maybe could also cause inflammation of the chiasm and you? MS. MS, yeah, very good. So you can get a demyelinating lesion that gives you a bitemporal field defect. And also, and I don't know if you guys will come up with this, I certainly did not. This woman has this really significant trauma history, right? She fell out of a second story window. She was unconscious for somewhere around three months. Is there any way that that could give you a field defect that looks like this and how? So you can get a sheer injury to the chiasm from, a, from blunt trauma like that. So we requested the images to look at them. And I'm not sure how well this is gonna show up, but she had these cystic spaces like surrounding the chiasm, so that's CSF there, and this is just another little slice, and like here and here, that confirmed the suspicion that she'd had a sheer injury to the chiasm back when she was a kid, and that's why she didn't notice any changes whatsoever in her vision, because you'd think that if it was really new, you would notice something like that. But. Although to be fair, most patients don't. A lot of times they don't notice that they have trouble with their vision until they're using monocular viewing and trying to read the eye chart. And they can't read the right half of the eye chart with their right eye or the left half of the eye chart with their left eye. That's true. So it, it, to be fair, you know, with both eyes together, you can often see pretty well. So is that like a bow tie optic Not exactly. What is all right, so we'll actually come back to that too. Okay, so the fourth case is a 44-year-old guy who went in to see his optometrist at the end of October because he noticed this black caterpillar in the left supratemporal visual field. So it was just kind of like sitting right there. And they found that he had swollen optic nerves on both sides. So an MRI was done which revealed an occipital tumor and that was resected and it was found to be a meningioma. But he's coming in to see us because he's had blurred vision in both eyes since the surgery. And he thinks maybe it's getting a little bit better, but he's having a really hard time like reading and he's very 
smart guy and he can't really do his work right now. So his central or his corrected acuity is 20-25 in the right eye, 20-20 in the left. He had no APD. His motility was fine. He was orthophoric. His confrontational fields were full. His color vision was a little bit down. His anterior segment was normal. And on fundus examination, his nerves were like this. Okay, so now what? What kinds of things will you ask him about? Okay, good. He's, his only medication is Keppra. Thanks. He gets headaches like occasionally, like maybe once every couple of weeks, but that's it. He's had a couple of those that he's noticed. Now, it's not happening very frequent, frequently, but he has noticed it. What? Yeah, he's noticed that a few times. He thought it was like raining outside and then realized that he was just hearing something in his ear. Okay, so what's the next step? Visual fields. And here's what they look like. Okay, so how would you describe this? Let's start with the blind spots. What would you say about that? Yes, they're both enlarged, right? And then what else does he have going on there? They kind of are secocentral, right? They're sort of, you know, right there. Um, but I think, and it's a little bit hard to tell, but you can kind of appreciate that there's a little bit of like a homonymous nature to that there. Um, but so could you get a secocentral scotoma and the enlarged blind spots based on just on his disc swelling? Yes. What? Not usually. Yeah, so that'd be really unlikely, right? So remember we talked before about how with d papilledema or disc edema from that, it'd be, it's like really unlikely to get central vision loss until it's really late. So it'd be very odd to have everything else in the periphery fine and then just the central loss. So that, just looking at that right there it should make you think, oh, that's probably something besides just disc swelling. So. If we say, okay, yeah, there's a little bit of a right homonymous, a little bit of a left homonymous, where do you expect to find a problem? Something on both sides, right? And it pro it's probably behind the chiasm, but. And it's central. And it's central. Right, so pretty far back in the occipital lobe. Okay, so I'm going to show you his pre-op scan. So that's his meningioma there, more in the right occipital lobe. And this is a coronal view. So what I wanted to point out here is how it's sort of enveloping and surrounding the confluence of sinuses there. And this is post-operatively. So I'm, I don't know how well it's really coming up there, but so you can kind of appreciate, this is a flare image, that he's got something going on here and something going on right there. So he's had, what, I heard a whisper. Does anyone know what's happened to him? Yeah, so he's kind of, so he's had bilateral occipital strokes. So they've re they removed that huge tumor, and then, you know, luckily he was just left with pretty small strokes, but it's in both occipital lobes there. So, but he's still got all that disc swelling, right? So what's the deal with that? Yeah, so we wanted to also look at the sinuses and see what was going on there. You know, as you remember, it was all kind of wrapped around the torcular, so he would be definitely at high risk for getting some thrombosis there. So this is the sagittal view, and I don't know if you can appreciate there. So he has, you know, clotted off his sinuses pretty, pretty well. So we put him on anticoagulation and we'll see how he does. He's still like, walking and talking and he's alive and he's not really miserable, so I thought that was really surprising. Okay, so. Uh, but I, I would just say though that blurred vision, that was his complaint was blurry vision. And um, you know, you might think, well maybe the blurred vision is from this pamphlet, but it's the visual field that told us 
that no, this blurred vision is not pamphletema. This blurred vision is related to this central visual field defect. And because he had it on both sides, he had that inferior uh, uh, homonymous defect in the right and then and on the left. Can you see how now going back now and knowing that he has bilateral occipital pole, uh, my, they're not big infarctions, they're little ones from removing this humongous tumor that was wrapped around his whole posterior aspect of his occipital lobes and his tortula. Um, you can kind of see how this could happen. And the bigger field defect seems to be, um, well, it was in his, his right eye was the bigger field oh, defect. Oh, right? my God. Yeah. <laughs> well, where's my thing? Back, Dang it. Back, back. I think they're both bad, I, you know, because they're, they're right there. So anyway, but it's bilateral. It's a very nice case, though, to how the visual field really, really helps you go, wow, well, this isn't his pamphlodema. This is definitely something else. OK, so I, I know we've seen some patients like this. And I was going through trying to find them, but I couldn't. So I can't show you their specific fields. But can anybody think of a scenario where one brain lesion can give you a homonymous hemianopsia, optic disc atrophy on both sides, and a relative efferent pupillary defect? What? Would that give you an afferent? What? Yes, the tract. the tract, the tract. So can you? Tell me which side the afferent pupillary defect would be on, like ipsilateral or contralateral? Yes, why? Yes, very good. And what would the atrophy look like? Yes, can anybody explain why? Uh, sort of, but not exactly. So that was a <laughs> that's the that's a lot of nickel rotation. Okay, so I thought I also didn't make this picture. I don't know if I'm allowed to put it in here, but I just thought it was a really nice illustration, the best one I could find. So actually, it was stolen from Bill Boyd's paper. So was this one from his paper? Jim Tara, uh has taken this drawing from Bill Hoyt's uh, hemioptic hypoplasia article of like 1968 or something like that. <laughs> so don't feel bad about okay. lifting this. <gasps> <laughs> okay, so let's say, so this is, we're going to say this is the right eye, okay, this is the left eye. So here's the right nerve, the right tract, left nerve, left tract. So let's say you have a lesion here in the left tract. So the fibers that you're going to hit from, let's say, the left eye, it's going to be the temporal retinal fibers, right? They come back here, they go back here. So temporal meaning temporal to the fovea. So these fibers come here and they come into the disc superiorly and inferiorly here. The fibers that you get from the right eye are going to be the ones from the nasal retina, right? The ones that will cross here and go into the left tract. Nasal meaning nasal to the fovea. It's going to be the papillomacular bundle here. Then these are the temporal retinal fibers coming in. And then here's the other nasal retinal fibers coming in. So you'll get atrophy here and here, which is why it's called the bow tie atrophy. Does that make sense? And then you're still going to, you're going to have a homonymous defect. Oh, does that make sense how I explain that? All right, quiz time. In the analysis of an automated static central 24-2, a congruous incomplete homonymous hemianopia is least likely to result from a lesion at the what?
which of the following visual fields is the best one to perform? Confrontational, Tangent, Humphrey, Goldman, any. patient with 20-20 vision in both eyes has a right afferent pupillary defect, localized pallor of both optic nerves, and a partial right homonymous hemianopia. The most likely explanation is Everybody have a paper copy? Like, is it totally pointless for me to do that? Okay. I think that there are one or two that don't. Sorry. There are some that don't? Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, I can bring it on. Sure. Bring it on. Does anybody else missing a copy? All right. Put your heads down and get to work, kids. <laughs> and we'll go over this with the answers. Okay. If I can remember. Some of them, they are kind of tricky questions. Excuse me. Decrepit. Is somebody missing the second page? No, Greece is just coming in both words. <laughs> oh, not the skin tell I can't, I don't understand what I'm. <laughs> 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 That's part of it. Do you have page two? Remember, I'm a neurologist. <laughs> so we 
don't listen to what Paige actually says. <laughs> Do I read it to you? Dear Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Ray, I'm doing great. I was in the hospital for a while, um, but I'm back now and everything seems to be just fine. They just won't let me drive and I don't really quite understand why. <laughs> They tell me I had a stroke, <laughs> but I feel fine. <laughs> Much love. <laughs> Hope to see you at Christmas. <laughs> this is an actual letter from an actual person to my actual mother. <laughs> Ray. <laughs> okay, from a charming lady in England. So, a, con a congruous, incomplete monotomyopia is least likely, I hate the least likely questions. So what do you guys think about number one? Congruous, I think, is the key. If it's a complete visual field, a complete hemianopia, it doesn't tell you anything, right? Because you don't get the congruity that's complete. It's all hemi all complete hemianopias are totally congruous. Mm -hmm. Lateral so I think in the, in the greater principles of things, the more posterior, the more congruous. So all I was looking for here is the, fur the furthest forward. So I would go with optic track in this one. Um, so which of the following key fields is the best one to perform? E. Anything. Anything. <laughs> okay, and then write it down. Uh, so 2020 vision, a right APD, localized pallor, uh, partial hemianopia, the most likely explanation. I mean, many of these are possible, but the most likely, the nice way to put it all together. B. Pardon? B. 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 Good. Sorry, I thought somebody was saying thing. Okay, a congruous homonymous superior coagulantinopsia may result from any of the following except <laughs> well, so parietal should give you inferior. more inferior, right? So it could be um, a temporal lobe, right? The, these are, I, I don't know, somehow the one that I sent you, I, I corrected it. So the written one is, is better written than, the, than those ones there. So it could be the optic radiations. Right? And so you could get a, a lesion um, in the optic radiations from um, multiple sclerosis, uh, a nice uh, uh, quadrinopia from the posterior pole, and occlusion from the MCA. What's occlusion of the MCA that you? Could you get it from occlusion of the MCA? Yeah, sure, of course. So, yay! I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not confident in your answers. <laughs> you have yeah. to say it with I did. <laughs> yeah. So the optic radiations in the parietal lobe should give you an inferior. So that's the only one that doesn't that. Good. Okay. A monocular visual field defect. Yeah. And why is uh, why can you get a monocular field defect in the hospital? How can you get a monocular field defect in the temporal? Uh, so the temporal crescent. Yeah, exactly. What part of the occipital lobe would be hit? I don't know. The most anterior part. Of so physiological. The right fixation in the right visual field where the optic nerve enters the eye. Right. So that's E. e. All right. So the most likely lesion, painless, sudden onset, middle aged woman, other eyes normal. And uh, so now in this, I'm, you know, it's like most likely painless, sudden onset. And I'm talking about sudden onset. Now, there are two Is possibilities. Is that to her that she noticed it or something? Yeah, it could be, could be. I would say in her. 
It could be nerve or retina, but what's more common? <laughs> okay, uh, so what about the actual defect itself? Does that does that give you information? Yeah, you have a nasal, inferior nasal stem, and a superior, almost, yeah, like a partial, almost superior. Superior. Yeah. Almost superior. yeah. So theoretically, um, the retina is going to give you less likely, is less likely to do something that crosses the horizontal meridian because of the vascular supply kind of stopping from the retina. Right this is the blind spot is enlarged. The blind spot is enlarged, that's another thing. And I I would venture to say that anterior stenic ophthalmography may be more common than um, retinal artery illusions. So I'm good with nerve here on this one. Okay, um, Reese, what do you think about this uh, letter? Dear Ray. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't tell from the picture what it's trying to show, but I mean, I said from your description, it's supposed to be like a neglect or something. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say occipital. Okay. Does what? Have any other opinions? I gave you the whole explanation about hemineglect. 